Well, hello. Good morning, guys. My name is Thomas, and uh, this is my beautiful wife, Debbie. She's in the dark right now, but there she is. And then my brother here is Tucker, and he's playing some percussion and singing. And we're so stoked to be here with you guys, and uh, I know the Lord's going to do some cool things. So if you guys want to stand up with us, uh, we have just a very small band up here. So we need all you guys to, you know, you can clap or I don't know if anybody plays tambourines out there, but they're all welcome in this place. So let's just let's worship the Lord this morning. He's coming on the clouds. Kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break. Every chain will break. This hell is great. You can stop the Lord Almighty. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle. Good morning, Crossroads Church of Denver. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. And you, those of you joining us online, welcome. Thank you. If you're brand new here today, I want to welcome you. I want to send a special thank you for joining us. If you want to check us out, right outside these doors to the left is our information counter. Um, so we're just happy to have you here with us. A couple of things. Today is Broncos Sunday. Any morning that the Broncos play, sorry we didn't announce this earlier, but any morning that the Broncos play, we will have a Broncos Sunday where you can come and enjoy food and fellowship after the game or after church, right? And here's our game, right? <laughs> after, after church and enjoy the game and celebrate and fellowship together. Go Broncos. 
October 16th. If you want to know more about what's going on, if you want to see a transparent church, October 16th, we have a town hall meeting. We want to invite you. Come check it out. We, we want to see our congregation come together and understand what's happening behind the scenes. So October 16th, right after church, come hang out with us. Let's uh, have a town hall meeting. Also in October, October 29th, Family Fall Festival is going on. I'm thinking about dressing up as Hunter Johnson. If I get enough votes, I'll buy the right wigs. Just kidding. I hope Hunter's watching us today. But October 29th, uh, we're gonna have you bring chili, cornbread, and pie. And you're gonna share it with everybody, and we're gonna have games for all the kids, and it's gonna be amazing. If you were there last year, you saw it, it's just gonna be better. Like, last year was great, right? It's gonna be that much better. Like, we're shooting for the stars, right? So come join us. Um, and that's it. That's it. So let's uh, get back to worship and with Thomas and the band. Thanks. Awesome. Well, we're going to transition into a time of communion here on this next song. And we have three, three or so more songs that we're going to just worship the Lord with. And so during this time, I just want to encourage um, you guys. There's an open communi communion up here at the front. So as you feel the Lord just leading you, um, you can come up here and take communion during this song. And and just as an encouragement, um, something that I know that the Lord really loves from us, which we're his kids, and something that he loves from us is just to come to him humbly. If there's stuff in our hearts, which I know for me, uh, waking up early can always cause me to, you know, have a bad attitude or something like that. But <laughs> there could be so many different things. You wake up in the morning and you're just filled with stress and doubt and fear and all this stuff, whatever's going on in your families. And sometimes we feel like we need to get those things fixed before we come to the Lord. But he, um, this next song is called Mighty to Save. He died on the cross so that we can come to him with all of our stuff, all of our junk, and just say, God, here I am, and um, I take the fullness of you, and I, I lay down myself and my insecurities and my struggles and my sin before you. And he wants that from us, just to come to him real and humbly and just do that. So if that's any encouragement to you, just to, you don't have to have all your stuff together to, to take communion. Really what that is is, it's just coming to the Lord and saying, here I am, and I'm surrendering underneath what you did for me on the cross, which was to take all of this stuff away, and I'm coming underneath you with that. So anyways, let that be an encouragement to you. We're just going to worship here, and, and you guys can take communion. My Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to say. He is mighty to say.
can move the mountains. My God is mighty to say. He is mighty to Become more aware 
of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence.
we just thank you for your presence in this place. You are welcome here, mighty God. Our hearts are open to you. Our spirits are open to you. God, I pray that you would just take the rest of this service and this message and that you would seal it deep, deep within our hearts, God. We love you, Jesus. You guys can be seated. Thank you. Good morning. I'm seeing orange and blue. We want to take a minute to dismiss the youth and uh, let's give them a hand for staying with us this morning. And uh, Thomas, that was awesome worship. Um, I just wish I had his hair. You know what I mean? If the ushers will come forward, we're going to take this morning's offering. What intimate worship and fellowship this morning. Yeah. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here this morning. We pray, Lord, that um, as we worship you with our tithes and offering, that, Lord, you would accept it as a sacrificial gift. Lord, we pray for those who don't have, Lord, as this week I've just been inundated with uh, emails and phone calls of hurting families. We lift them up to you, Lord. Pray that you would bless them, that they're able to uh, participate in this worship. And, Lord, for those of us that you've just uh, overwhelmed with, with gifts, Father God, with the wonderful jobs and whatnot, Lord. Pray that you would help us to be sacrificial, Lord, in our giving. Uh, Lord, we all want to worship you, Lord. We pray for those who have and who don't have, Lord. Lord, pray that you open our hearts and our minds this morning as we dig into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to welcome those of you online. And uh, how would you guys like the lights on so you could see your Bibles? How many of you guys brought your Bibles this morning? All right, all right. I think I saw an orange and blue Bible. <laughs> I don't think that's sacrilegious, but... Philippians chapter 2, verse 25 through 30. And um, it's always tough to follow Pastor Tom because he lays things out so beautifully. And he's went through the Apostle Paul, and he's talked about Timothy. And this morning we're going to be talking about a, a, an unknown guy named Epaphroditus. And um, some of you probably have never heard of him before, and... Um, he's a guy who's sort of tucked away behind the curtains and behind the scenes, but you're going to learn this morning that he's one of the most important characters. Um, in fact, his character trait is one of the most important characters that we would have as a supporter of ministry. But before we get in there, if you'll turn your Bibles there and sort of keep your thumb there, I would like to build a foundation for you before we actually jump into this text so that way you're able to understand where we're going with this because it's good to paint a picture 
with uh, broad strokes, but sometimes you need the details, and I really want to hone you into those details this morning. For those of you guys who have never uh, thought about missions, maybe you, it's never crossed your mind to go around the world and preach the gospel, um, it might be a little foreign to you. But I know that there's people sitting in this room right now whose hearts are burning to do something for ministry. I'll never forget when I had my own church, my, uh, a guy showed up uh, from California, and his wife was introducing him to me. In fact, he was my uh, assistant pastor, Fernando, and he's a pastor in his own church now, praise the Lord. And, uh, but he came, and his wife was introducing him and to me, and she, she says, this is my husband, and he's just standing there, and I thought, well, maybe he can't talk, you know what I mean? And I said, well, what does he do? And she started telling me, and, and he sort of rolled his eyes, and he, he went crazy. He says, you know what? I just want to do something for Jesus, man. I don't want to just sit here and warm a seat. I want to do something, you know? So I gave him a broom, and uh, he started cleaning and uh, started wiping the toilets down, and I even have it on video. We had a bad snowstorm that year, and he shoveled the whole parking lot with a shovel. And um, so we'll have to call him when we have our first snowstorm here. <laughs> But you know what? He wanted to do something for the Lord, and, and really that was the beginning of, of servanthood ministry. And then he became my assistant pastor, and the rest is history. But there's some of you who are just, you have this nervous tick about you. Your legs won't stop moving. Your arms won't stop twitching because you want to do something for the Lord. You know what? Missions is an exciting thing, and we see this with Paul and with Timothy. But there's, other, there's others of you in the room who are thinking, well, I, I don't think God's calling me to Africa. I don't think God's calling me to South America. I don't think God's really given me a, a mission per se to go to a certain part of the earth and preach the gospel. Well, this message is going to be for you as well because we're going to see that there's a support system that, that happens in, our, in the body that needs to be there. We need to have our missionaries and our pastors and our churches well supported, not just with money, but with your time, with your energy, with your resources. So I want to build a foundation that will sort of launch you into really appreciating this guy. And I guarantee you by the end of this sermon, you're never going to forget about Epaphroditus. Somebody's going to mention him to you one day, and you're going to say, I remember all about him. While well, Jesus gave the disciples commands to both make disciples and be his witnesses in all the earth. If you're taking notes this morning, Matthew chapter 28, very famous scripture, verse 18 through 20 says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Jesus gives this command that we would make disciples, that we would uh, go into all the nations and do this. And then later on, we're going to see that in Acts chapter 1, he's going to tell the disciples after his resurrection, he's going to say them, tell them, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus' passion, his drive was that we would preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And in fact, it should be something that's in us no matter who we are. We don't, you don't have to be, be a Billy Graham. You don't have to be a missionary. Maybe you support a missionary outside of this church, and you don't have to be that person. But you should have a passion and a drive for the lost to come to know the Lord. Well, ministry takes a team, folks. Ministry takes a team, not just an individual. And sometimes you hear words or names like Billy Graham, and they're wonderful, aren't they? We tune, we tune them in on our TVs. We watch them on the big stage when we turn our TVs on. But the truth of the matter is that there's a team behind those people. It's not just that individual. Even though I'm able to get up here and preach on Sunday morning, there's a team that is behind the scenes working hard, cleaning the bathrooms, vacuuming the sanctuary, vacuuming the vestibule, blowing off the leaves as you were walking in. Maybe you saw some of this happening. When the snow falls, shoveling the snow. And guys, we, we, we welcome you to that ministry. If it's ever snowing at your house and you're shoveling and this little light bulb comes on, Come on down and help us out on a Sunday morning because we need you. But there's a lot of support system that goes into being a team. It's not just one individual that gets up there. You know, the Billy Graham team, uh, one year before he even gets on stage and preaches his sermon, there's a prayer team and a planning team that goes in and that's involved one whole year before. When we did a youth crusade, uh, we used to do youth crusades across the country, and when, before we would do them, we took our sort of our instruction from them, and we started forming our crusade team. We, we appointed a crusade coordinator so that way we could be praying for the whole year and getting churches involved. 
So it's not just that day, all of a sudden you see this guy get up and he starts preaching the gospel. It, there was a lot of planning that went into it and it's a team effort. We need everybody, all hands on deck as it were. Well, the harvest is truly plentiful, uh, Matthew chapter 9 says, but the laborers are few. And that's a plural word, laborers. Therefore, the, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Again, it's a pluralistic word. These are laborers. You know, I always talk about when I came to the Lord, um, people gave me their old tapes, you know what I mean? Nobody had tapes anymore, and people give me their Christian tapes. And I had boxes of Christian tapes. And I don't know if you guys, if you've been a Christian for uh, longer than 20 years, you probably remember Lanny Wolf. Any of you guys remember the Lanny Wolf trio? I see some heads shaking. Well, there was a song that would make me cry all the time, and it was called, My Father, or My House is Full. And the words go like this, Push away from your table, look out the window pane. Just beyond this house of plenty lies a field of golden grain. And it's ripe unto harvest, but the reapers, where are they? They're in the house. Oh, can't the children hear the Father sadly say? And of course, the chorus says, My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. I named this sermon this morning, Pioneers, Church Planters, and Supporters, because it was a team, a ministry flowchart, if you will, that Paul exposes us to in Philippians chapter 2. And we all need to be part of this team. Well, let's start with Apostle Paul very quickly and very briefly, because uh, I definitely think we've heard a lot about Apostle Paul and Timothy. But very briefly, I want to set this up for you. The Apostle Paul was a pioneer. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to know in a couple of seconds here. But pioneers have this driving desire to go where the gospel has never been preached before. In fact, in the 1800s, when the gospel was taken to West Africa, the missionary's life expectancy was six months. So they would get off the ship, these missionaries would get off the ship because they had a burning drive and a burning desire to preach the gospel. And they would get off the ships and some of them wouldn't even make it to the beach depending on who was at the beach. But they would infiltrate the, the towns and the villages and what would happen is that they would get killed by the natives. Well, that didn't stop the missionaries from coming. In fact, they would just flood into West Africa and it was six months was the, was the life expectancy. When the, when the gospel started going to Korea, there's stories, and you can read, there's abundance of stories about how the missionaries went around the world. And when they started going to Korea, what, what was happening is that they had never been there before. And these ships, these European ships would come, and they would, they would, of course, they'd have the big masts and whatnot, and the Korean people would see them coming, and the, the natives would be there on the shore waiting to see if it was an enemy, if it was a foe. And when these People would be getting off the ships, they would come to the shore, they would anchor uh, out in the sea, and they would come to shore carrying these boxes, these wooden crates, and they didn't know what they were. They had no idea what was going on. And so what would happen is the natives would, would kill them even before they got on the shore. And they didn't stop coming. They wouldn't relent from coming. They would still come upon the shore. And they started learning that in order to get these Bibles to the shore, we actually have to get as close as we can before they kill us and throw them to the shore. And, and because they did that, there's stories that say the Koreans actually learned how to read these Bibles and started desiring that somebody would come and teach, and they started praying to God, and guess what? The missionaries started coming. So you know what? A pioneer is somebody who goes out, the first one, to almost as it were cut through the brush, to cut through the, the trees, and to make a way, maybe where the, the gospel has never went before. And that was Paul. He wasn't afraid to go where the gospel had never been. And we see this. And we know that it's not an easy task. In fact, not everybody's called to world missions, but somebody's got to go, folks. Somebody's got to go. Now, don't get crazy on me, all right? Don't go home and say, honey, I hear the Lord call me to the Sudan, you know what I mean? And, and then we don't hear from you anymore, you know? Make sure that it's the Lord, because if it's the Lord, you're going to have this driving desire. You're going to wake up every morning with your eyes wet, telling your wife, I need to go to the Sudan, or I need to go to South America, wherever it might be. But I want to challenge you this morning. You want to be a pioneer in the world, there's a pioneer waiting for you next door. Sometimes we're willing to get on a plane or on a ship and go thousands of miles to another destination, but we won't go 20 feet next door. You know what? There's unsaved people in your apartment facilities. There's unsaved people across the street from you, across the alley from you. There's, un there's unsaved or uncharted territory just down the street. And I challenge you this morning that you would be a pioneer and you would go out onto the world and that you would make disciples of every nation, even in your neighborhood. 
Well, we see that Paul was willing to be a pioneer, to go where the gospel had never been preached before. In fact, if I could steal your attention, in Romans chapter 15, again, if you're taking notes, verse 18 through 20, Paul says these words, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel where no Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Is God calling you to plant a church? Don't plant it up the block. Go somewhere where the gospel is not being preached. And you might think, this is America. This is America. I had a boss one time ask me if I lived in a Christian neighborhood. And I thought, this isn't Iraq. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? This is America. But you know what? Truthfully, there's places where you could go plant a church. Some of the most difficult places to plant a church is in a small community. And most church planters, if they have a nice haircut, you know, and they want to be on camera, they don't want to go to a small community where you might pastor 50 people for the rest of your life and never be on the, online. But you know what? That's where the heart of the gospel is, to go where no man will go uh, with the gospel. Go plant somewhere where nobody wants to be because those people are going to want you there. Very, very important that we have the heart and, and that we would go out to where Jesus is not being preached. Well, so the apostle Paul was a pioneer. I think you got it. He was the one who led the way. And then he had his Timothy. And Timothy is a church planter. We see that Timothy was an apostolic deputy. If I could coin that term, then I will this morning. It, it, just like we have deputies of the sheriff's department, right? I deputize you to do these things. It was almost as if Paul deputized Timothy to go out and to preach the gospel and to encourage the churches all around. His job was to raise and develop and train leaders within the local churches. And in fact, church planting is very difficult. I'll tell you why. Because you start to form relationships. You start to get close to the people. And, and before you know it, you know that your end is coming. You know that something's going to happen. I was invited by the Foursquare uh, denomination in 2002 to plant a church for them. And um, I willingly went. And it was so exciting. It was a challenge and it was tough, but it was exciting because I got to know the people. And what happens is that I knew I wasn't going to be there forever, and, but that didn't stop me from making relationships. I got to know people. I'm a relational guy. I love to know about, uh, about your family, about your comings and goings. If you ever have me over your house and I go to your bathroom, I'm going to look in your medicine cabinet. I'm just, I'm just really nosy. You know what I mean? And uh, so if, I'm just warning you now, if you ever have me over, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use your bathroom. I'm going to look in your medicine cabinet. I, don't, I just like to know, you know who I'm dealing with and whatnot. <laughs> so I, I like to build relationships. And when you're church planting, it's really, you really want to do that. You want to get to know people. Now, it's impossible to know everybody, right? Every detail about everybody. And I challenge you to try it. It's, it's very difficult. But you can know deep things and one or two things about a person, and then you get close to people. Well, I'll tell you what, when the Lord started telling me it's time to move on, and I knew it. I went to my, uh, to my assistant pastor and one day, and I said, listen, I think that God's uh, preparing you to take over this church. And uh, he freaked out. And he said, no, no, man, that, that can't be me. Well, I said, I really believe I'm hearing from the Lord, but pray about it. And the next week, he came with tears in his eyes, and he said, you know what? The Lord's been dealing with my heart for a long time concerning this matter. And so we, before you know it, I was preaching less and less, and he would preach, and then before you know it, I, I left. But it was a heartbreak because I had to leave this community where I had formed relationships, where I had, I had dug and planted deep roots. So being a church planner could be very heartbreaking. It's, you, you have this uh, heart for the people, and then you know you're going to leave. Well, Timothy, he built these relationships. In fact, during his tenure, we see that relationships were being formed. Church discipline was being shaped. This was a new church community, folks. Um, it was a whole new group of people following the resurrection of Jesus. And there was appropriate order during times of fellowship that was being implemented. The things that you do during fellowship and the things that you don't do. And so this stuff, Timothy was going around the churches talking about these things. But church planning is difficult on the body and on the emotions. If I could run through this with you, some of you might be interested, some of you might not, but it is sort of an interesting topic. And if you're ever called to plant a church or come and be a pastor, what happens is that you'll probably first be called to, to come and be an interim pastor, somebody that comes and really it's called the audition. That's what I call it, right? They're auditioning you. 
and uh, they, they, they said, well, we don't really, we're not really hiring a pastor yet, but will you come and be our interim pastor? That's so that way if, if you preach three wrong messages in a row, they could say, hey, I think we got it from here, you know? And then if you do good at that, what happens is that they want you to cast a vision and a mission. And really what that is is uh, building a foundation for, for the whole church. And then you develop the relationships, as I said. This is building trust with the people. And then you identify those with giftings. And really, that's team building. And then you train leaders, and that's equipping. And then what happens? If you're a good leader and you're following what the Holy Spirit prescribes, you delegate. You delegate, and that's really empowering people to do the ministries that God has called them to do. And truly, if you really want to be a church planter and you really want God to work through you, you're going to duplicate yourself. And, you know, I've always worked myself out of a job. I've always had people that we, I raised up who just were on fire for the Lord who wanted to be part of the ministry. And then when you're church planting, sometimes, especially if you're an interim pastor, you've got to leave, and that's where the heartbreak comes in. Well, Timothy was there until he got to Ephesus, right? And then he became the pastor of Ephesus, and he stayed there the remainder of his tenure, as, as Scripture sort of says. Well, then there's Epaphroditus. There's Epaphroditus. We get to the scripture in Philipp or the, the portion in Philippians chapter 2 where we run into this odd name, this behind-the-scenes person, and really I would call him the support system. And let's read Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. We're finally there. The guys up in the booth have been waiting for me to read this portion so they could put it on the wall. Verse 25, yet I consider it necessary, if you have a pen or a pencil, circle the word necessary, to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. There's a lot of things you could circle in that one verse. Well, his name, let's deal with his name very quick, Epaphroditus. It's a great name for your next child. Some of you who are uh, having a baby in the next few months, you know, just... Uh, Write it down. Don't forget to put it on your, on your refrigerator at home. You know, you could call him little pappy when he's born. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it's going to work for you. You know, it'll be the, that child will be the next president of the United States, Mr. President Epaphroditus, pappy. And um, while his name comes from uh, a Greek goddess, if you remember Aphrodite, and his name actually means loved by Aphrodite, and uh, probably and possibly had non-Christian parents because a Christian parent would not name their child after a goddess. And so he, he probably was a pagan who came to know the Lord under the, the new ministry. Um, he's mentioned only in Philippians, and he's sort of a behind-the-scenes guy. And, you know, I know a lot of guys who are behind the scenes. In fact, they're amongst you today. These guys, some of them are your ushers. They're your greeters. Some of them, they don't even do any of that. They do so behind the scenes, you never see them. And um, they would be upset if I pointed them out. They're praying for you up in the prayer room. They're doing these things. On Wednesday night when I teach, I love it because um, I come and if I run upstairs to make copies of something, I see them all with their heads bowed up in a prayer room that we've designated up on the second floor. And I know they're praying for me. And I know they're praying for you. But they're behind the scenes. We don't, we don't march them across the stage. And we need people like this. Well, we see that um, he's, uh, he's just sort of a, uh, an odd figure in the scripture that we never really see. But he, the word says, I considered it necessary to send him to you. And as you get to know this wonderful guy, you're going to see why Paul is saying these words, but we're going to save that just for a while. But you know what? He was an awesome brother. But the, the scripture goes on to say, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier. Well, let's break this down because I thought this was very interesting. The Greek word adelphos is used here for brother. And uh, really, it, it connotes this image of coming from the womb together. We know that um, Epaphroditus was not Paul's brother, natural brother. Um, but we know that Paul looked at him so close as a brother that they even came from the womb together. You, ever, you have friends like that? I do. I have friends that I know they'll do anything for me. And what do we say? We say terminology like my brother from another mother, right? You know, and uh, you women, you say my sister from another mister. You know, and uh, so we have that brotherly love. We have that connection with people. And this is exactly how Paul looked at Epaphroditus. He had gotten so close to him, developed such a close relationship with him that he says, this is my brother. This is my brother. And then he goes on and he says, my fellow worker. And the Greek word 
for fellow worker is synergos. And I looked all these up last night because I really wanted to give you the, the full meaning and full context of these, me of these words and these phrases. And this, I this is identified by our English word synergy, and you've heard of that word. And um, so I, gave, I wanted to give you the uh, definition to that too. And this is the definition, to interact or cooperate with to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate efforts. So synergos, the fellow worker, what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying, I couldn't do what I'm able to do without being together with this person. Without this person, without this support, I'm dead in the water. I cannot be collectively uh, energetic the way that I am if this person wasn't in my life. That, that's pretty big. Those of you who are married, you could hold your wife or your husband's hand now, you know, and because that's you. You guys are synergistic. You guys are fellow workers. You know, in, in, the book, in Genesis, we see that it was a helpmate. They were helpmates to each other. And, and in our marriages, in our family, we do just that. We're a, co we're a cooperative. And now those of us who might be single in the room, you know what? You have a best friend. You have somebody who you re really rely on. Somebody who you know that if you get together with, the, the total sum of your talents, the total sum of your individuality, when put together, it's going to make a team. And don't we do this at our work? Some of, the, some of you who are managers and supervisors, you put a team together and you don't try to have all the answers. If you're smart, you don't do this. You don't try to have all the answers because you know your limitations. You know that if you put a lot of heads together, then they're going to come up with ideas and they're going to come up with trends that maybe you never heard about. And you get to take all the credit for it. You know what I mean? Because what happens, they come together collectively, and I've done this, in, in a boardroom, and, and ideas pop out, and one person will have that one right answer. And you'll go, man, we're going to run with that. And everybody says, man, that's a great idea. You know what Paul's saying? Paul's saying, I wouldn't have had the great ideas that I have. I wouldn't have thought so in broad spectrums if this man was not part of my life. He's my fellow laborer. He's my fellow worker in the Lord. You know, we see this uh, collective uh, idea with three Hebrew children, remember? Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel? And I love these guys because they're working together. It seems to be one spokesman, right? And of course, uh, you know the story. They're told by Nebuchadnezzar to bow down. Nebuchadnezzar makes this image of gold. And he has all the people bowing down. He says, all right, we're going to get together on this hillside in this field. And when the trumpets blow, do -do 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 -do, everybody bow down. That's my trumpet. <laughs> and so what happens? You know, everybody bows down except these three Hebrew children. And they're just standing... You know, I, if, they were, if they were short, then they might have been missed, you know, like me. But they were probably tall Hebrew children. We don't really know. But here they are standing up, and somebody says, hey, yo, Nebi, uh, you know, those three guys out there are not bowing down. And so you know the story. They, they get brought forward, and Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, I'm going to give you one more chance. When you hear the trumpeteers uh, blow their trumpets, I want, I want you to bow down. And one of them, the spokesman, says, hey, you know what? Uh, God will rescue us from this flame. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. We're still not going to bow down. And, you know, I, I think about this sometimes because I think about the collective energy there, the, the collective enthusiasm. They needed each other, you know? And maybe one of them's going, hey, bro, what'd you tell him? What do you mean if God doesn't <laughs> deliver us? You know what I mean? No, don't worry. God's going to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still... Wait, 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 wait. Go back to, go back to that part where if he doesn't you know maybe they had a little theology meeting well you know we don't we don't know if god is going to but god loves us so much he's going to protect us but if he doesn't no 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 no. that if word is getting me bro you know but they they had now i'm i'm speaking outside the word so i better chill but it's just my my crazy bald-headed imagination you know this conversation that goes on now uh, these are things i think about in the shower you know but anyway we know that collectively they supported each other and they said, we will not bow. And I think about this sometimes because, you know, uh, we like to fudge on our Christianity sometimes, don't we, you know? And uh, it, the society wants us to bow down to certain ideas, you know? And I think sometimes if, if it was me, I might, the trumpets blow, you know, and I might be like, oh, I dropped those keys down here, you know? You know? <laughs> da, 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 da. Oh, what is that on the ground there, you know? No, but what did they do? They stood erect and they said, we will not bow down. 
but collectively they stood together. And I think as the body of Christ, ministry is a team. We need to stand together with that synergism to be fellow workers so we support each other. Doesn't Ecclesiastes, I'm, I'm off my notes now, I'm done. Doesn't Ecclesiastes <laughs> encourage us that, that, a, that we need to, when one is down, the other one is able to be up and to encourage the other? We need to stand with each other like that. And Paul is saying, this is my main man. This is the guy. He's my, you know what? What do we call it? My ride and die. My ride and die. He's the guy who I'm with all the time. We see that Esther had the same attitude. She said, if I die, I die. If I die, I die. And she had the encouragement of her uncle Mordecai and the encouragement of the rest of the people. But we need each other. We can't do it alone. While we see that, the scriptures also say here that he was a messenger. He was a messenger. Well, we know that he carried this letter from Rome, from this jail where Paul was locked up. He carried this message back to Philippi. Now, I want to give you the perspective of where this was at and how hard this would have been. So Philippi was about 800 miles from Rome. Now, in today's world, you're thinking, get on Delta, you know what I mean? Get on... Uh, Southwest or whatnot. Well, they didn't have airplanes in the first century. For some of you who skipped history, <laughs> there was no airplanes in the first century. There was no trains that you could throw mama from, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so what happened? They, they had to walk. And I looked it up last night, uh, some cities that are 800 miles or so away from Denver, and Las Vegas is about 800 miles away from Denver, if you wanted to know. Hopefully the Lord's calling you there to preach the gospel. Boise, Idaho, St. Louis, Dallas. These are places, can you imagine walking a letter to Dallas? Can you imagine walking a letter to Boise, Idaho? But you know what? He was a messenger, and guess what? These messages needed to get back to the church to let the church know what was going on with their missionary. Does that make sense? See, today we have email, and we could just email, hey, how you doing? And we, we could talk to missionaries around the world, and I do it very often. And we find out how they're doing. We find out their hardships. Maybe sometimes they'll even ask for uh, support, monetary support. And so you throw them a few bucks and whatnot. But they're able to do that because we have email now. Can you imagine having to walk 800 miles? But, you know, Paul's realizing this. Paul's realizing that this is also an intricate part of the ministry, that a communication would be sent to the supporting churches. Listen, this is important. He didn't just put this in there just as a blase, as something to pass over. But he says, listen, guys, you sent a messenger to me. This is so cool. And, and again, it's building the heart for why Paul feels it necessary to send him back. Are you guys getting it? They would have been missing him a lot. And so he puts this in here. Well, and to continue with verse 25, one who ministers to my need. And again, the Greek word here is liturgos. And it's used to connote someone who does more than just serve as a servant, but actually has the ability to minister as a priest would. I want to challenge you. If you've, if you've never done this, you can do this. And maybe you need permission. I give you permission right now. <laughs> Have you ever had communion with somebody in the hospital? It's such a beautiful thing. Um, a few months ago, maybe a year ago, um, a friend of mine, his mother was dying, and she was in hospice, and... Um, I showed up with communion. And he just thought, this, that's so awesome, man. And I brought enough for the whole family. I figured there would be a lot of people there. And, and, um, and I brought communion. And you don't have to be so fancy about it. I mean, you don't have to have a pastor's license to go get communion from family Christian. You know what I mean? You just go get it. Just go get it and go get grape juice. And uh, they sell the little cups there. I mean, do it, do it the way you want. But it's so beautiful to be able to minister in this way, to be able to go when somebody's on their deathbed and to have communion with them and to pray with them. And this is something easy. You know, I always say, try to look for the low-hanging fruit. Well, this is low-hanging fruit for those of you who want to do ministry. And you're wondering, what do I do? What, what, what can I do for the Lord? Go take somebody communion. They'll appreciate it. They'll never forget it. And I went to have communion. It was such a beautiful time. And then we, we sang some songs and whatnot. And um, you know, depending on how they liked my voice, some of them were probably like, I could done without the music, you know what I mean? But the, but the ministry that was done was very beautiful. And you don't have to go through Bible college or seminary to do some of these things. And I believe that the, the word here, this liturgy, this lit, lit, liturgos, the word here 
connotes this ability not only just to be there to throw the trash, but to be there to say, Paul, I want to pray with you, bro. I want to pray with you. You know what? You're going to be talking to these guards. You're going through these things. You're going to be developing your thoughts for a message or what, whatever it might be. Let me pray with you, man. Could it even be, and this is again my imagination, could it even be that, that he went and he maybe massaged his shoulders or even washed his feet, maybe took care of his clothes, maybe even just served him in ways that you and I would not even serve each other today. But he was there ministering. Maybe he even sang songs of praise, you know? Maybe he sang songs of praise. And I'll never forget, I picked up an inmate from Jefferson County Jail. And um, the reason I picked him up is because I was visiting one and on the way out, this guy who was waiting there when I went in was still waiting for his ride. And I felt like the Lord is asking me to ask him if he needs a ride home. So I said, hey, man, I see you were, you've been waiting here. He's like, yeah, I just got released. I was, somebody was supposed to pick me up. And I said, I don't know where you live, but I'll take you home. But you got to go to church with me first. And uh, he's like, oh, man, I don't know. You know, he was kind of doing the little Nicky thing, you know. And uh, <laughs> you guys have watched that movie, shame on you. So, um, we, so I said, all right, man, well, hey, have a good night. And he chased me down. And he says, hey, I, you know what? I, I live in Aurora, man. Are you willing to drive to Aurora? I said, you know, I'll drive to Aurora. We got to go to church first. And on, on, the, way, he, on the way to church, uh, I really felt like the Lord was telling me to sing to him. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to myself, right? I'm like, Lord, I don't want to sing to this guy, you know what I mean? And he's probably thinking, I got a little Nicky going on, you know? But he's looking at me kind of weird, and he's really pasted up to the passenger side window there, you know? And, and, and I'm like, no, Lord. This is... So I'm like, hey, bro, you mind if I sing to you? And he's like, oh, you know, do what you want. So I start singing a song to him. I start singing some worship songs to him, and and he starts crying, and I thought, see, Lord, he doesn't even like you. You know what I mean? <laughs> and and uh, anyway, we, we get to the church, and uh, worship is going on. And right here in the back of this aisle right here, he gets down on his knees. He gave his life to the Lord. But you know what? Sometimes ministry, yeah, praise God. <laughs> ministry could be singing a song to somebody, singing a song, going, if you don't have a guitar, then it's okay. Just do the air guitar, you know? You could do it. And maybe singing a song. But maybe Epaphroditus just sang worship songs to Paul. Maybe making him, helping him remember the, the songs that were sung together in the fellowship. We don't really know, but it must have been an intimate time. This wouldn't have been this guy coming in the door going, you got some trash for me to throw? I don't know. They sent me over here to help you out. No, this would have been intimacy. This would have been um, emotion, emotional. This would have been, I don't know how many other words to use. This would have been a very close relationship and fellowship that they had. And we need to have that with each other, folks. We need to have that with each other. Maybe you feel like God's not calling you to Africa or God's not calling you to South America, but he might be calling you across the street to ask your neighbor, you mind if I go do communion with your mom who's in the hospital? Do you mind if I sing a song to you? Do you mind if I do something that doesn't require me to have a ministry license? And you know what? They just might say yes. And I want to warn you, nine out of ten times, they probably will. So be ready for it. But Epaphroditus would have been a servant. He would have been almost as this priest to come and minister to Paul. And what a thing to be able to minister to the Apostle Paul, right? We think of the Apostle Paul ministering to us, but truly he would have had this lay pastor's heart. And it's an awesome thing to be a lay pastor. I actually think we need more around here. And if you'd like to be a lay pastor, let's talk about it. Let's pray and see what the Lord's doing in your life. Because really the job of a lay pastor is doing just that. Hospital visits. Uh, maybe, maybe checking on somebody who hasn't been to church in a while. Uh, doing these extra things where sometimes the pastor can't do these things because the pastor is busy studying, doing a lot of counseling, and you could go out. And there's nothing like doing a hospital visit, folks. It's so beautiful. Some of you lay pastors can learn how to do a funeral. You know, that's not, that's not uh, above the uh, uh, line of doing some pastoral ministry. If you're properly trained and the church lays hands on you and they give you that authority to do some of these things, it's a beautiful thing. But you know what? We won't ever know if you don't stand up and say, pick me, pick me. You know what I mean? You're waiting for us to go knock on your door. We don't even know where you live. You know what I mean? And 20 years ago, you wouldn't have wanted me to know where you live. So, I mean, <laughs> but being a pastor and being this sort of priest for the Lord, and doesn't Peter say that we are a royal priesthood? We are our chosen generations to minister. And so we see Epaphroditus doing this. Well, Let's go on to verse 26. I think we're digging in and learning about this guy. You're going to circle this whole chapter, I'm sure, at some point. Verse 26, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. 
For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. A lot of adjectives here. While Pepperdice was obviously an others-centered person, he wasn't focused on himself. And in fact, if you remember earlier in the chapter, verse 3 and 4, Paul admonishes the church in Philippi to have this kind of character. In fact, he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let, let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so we see that Paul already adm admonishes this. But look at these adge adjectives, if you want to circle them, longing and distressed. This must have been an awesome man of God. He must have been somebody who you would have loved to get to know. You know that guy? You know that woman who just ministers to your very soul? He must have been that person. He must have been deeply missed in his local church community. He would have been gone for months, folks. This wouldn't have been a two-day track. He would have been gone for several months. And is it possible? We don't really know what the sickness was. I believe that the sickness probably was maybe a cold or a flu or something that he got from his travels or whatnot. But it, could he have been homesick too? Possibly just so, so much missing his home fellowship and, and they were missing him. I mean, can you imagine being that kind of presence? Somebody that has a presence so big and so large because of how you minister before the Lord that you're missed when you're gone? You know, I got to admit, and I, maybe I need to repent for this, but there's some people I just don't want to have around. You know, I don't know if you have some of those. Don't raise your hand, you know. They, you might have brought them to church, and I don't want them to know, you know what I'm saying? But here's the thing. There's some people we just don't want around, isn't there? There's just some people who have an attitude that is just a bad attitude all the time, and they're complaining all the time, and they just don't have any great outlook on life. And you try to avoid them like the plague. You know, they, they pop up on your phone, and you go, Ugh. you know? And then the Holy Spirit convicts you, and you go, oh, no, 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 no! How you doing, brother? Man, I've been waiting for your phone call. But then there's those people who you just love to be around, don't you? You think about them when you wake up. You pray for them. You, you, you call them and ask them what they're doing this weekend. You, you want to know what's going on in their lives because they're just that close to you. They're, their presence is that big in your life. They encourage you. They exhort you when you need to be exhorted. They're there for you. They've got your back. They, they know everything about you, and they still love you. And he must have been that kind of guy to his local church, his home church. And you know what? They were missing him, I'm sure. And Paul sees this. Paul sees the homesickness that he even felt. And Paul says, listen, guys, I've got to send him to you because he was longing for you guys. He was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Look at this, this mention here. He was thinking about others. He was thinking about them. He was thinking that I don't want them to be stressed over me being sick. Do you have those people in your life? I, I know people like that. You call them and they're like, hello. You're like, man, what's going on? Oh, I've been sick the last three days. How come you never called me? Well, because I didn't want to put this stress on you. I didn't want to put this stress on you. Now, there's the flip side too, right? We'll leave that chapter. We'll keep going on. Because we have people who just want to be babied and want to be pampered in our lives sometimes. But we have those people who just want to pamper you, who care about your comfort, who care about your needs. You know, it's the person who buys a burrito and they take it to work and you go, man, I'm hungry. And you don't know it, but they go, you know what? Here's a burrito for you. And you don't even know that they didn't eat because they were other-centered. It's that person who has that cup of coffee, you know, that Starbucks coffee. And they just got it. They're perfect coffee, you know. And, and you're so tired, they see you and they go, you know what, man? Here's a cup of coffee. They're other-centered. And the Bible says that we need to be other-centered. Jesus was other-centered. And this would have been a man who was full of that other-centeredness, if it's not a phrase it is now. Because you know what? He didn't think about himself. And what a great person to be able to have around. And I have folks like this in my life. And it's, it's so awesome. Well, verse 29, 
Paul says, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. There's a lot to unpack in these two verses, and I would like to unpack them with you right now. We see that we should hold such men in esteem. And in my opinion, I think we've gotten away from that throughout the years. We don't hold men of God in high esteem anymore. You know, when I got into the ministry, it wasn't the most popular thing to do. And I talked to older gentlemen, and they would say, back in the 40s and 50s, you were really highly esteemed if you were a pastor. And now you want to be careful that people don't know your address to come and throw a brick through your window, you know. And I'm not talking about fellow believers. I'm talking about those people who hate Christ, the enemies of the cross. But you know what? I think we, even in the church, have failed to hold men like this at high esteem. You know, I think of when I first uh, became a pastor or I was on my way to becoming a pastor, some of the men in my life, you know, and, and I know you're here today, Irv, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you, but Irv Cole was a man of God in my life. And he taught me what it meant to serve the Lord. And he did the same thing. He gave me a broom and a mop, you know, and I'll never forget mopping the floors. And he'd say, that's not good enough, man. You got to mop in this corner. I'm like, nobody's going to see this corner, you know, but he taught me how to serve the Lord with my whole heart, that I'm serving the Lord and, and serving the Lord is serving people. But he didn't just teach me how to clean, folks. He taught me how to pray. How many times in the parking lot would, he, would I be telling him, uh, uh, sharing a problem with him, and he would put his arm around me, and he would go to the Lord in prayer right there? You know, how many times would I call him and, and uh, rat on my wife, you know what I mean, that she was doing something weird, you know? No, I'm just kidding. Usually it was the other way around. She even threatens me. She says, I'm calling Herb. And then I straighten up really quick. But you know what? How many times has he been there to counsel and just been there to lend an ear? And, and I could go on and on and on. There's several men in my life. Pete Aguiano, I don't know if you're here. and I'm, I'm sure I'm embarrassing him too. And they'll beat me up later on. They're, they're, they're bigger than me. But uh, you know what? What a, what a great guy in my life. We, we were on staff together here several years ago. And you know what? We'd be printing bulletins upstairs. And, and we would just talk. And he would just speak the word of God into my life. But I esteem these guys. And I could go on and on and on. I esteem them. I put them on a pedestal. You know, even though I've raised through, uh, there's no such thing as ranks in ministry, but even though I'm a pastor now, and they sometimes would see themselves as, all right, man, you've, you've uh, reached some kind of plateau or whatever. There's no such thing. Let me tell you right now. There's no such thing as a plateau. It's just more responsibility for the souls of people. But you know what? I still approach them like this. Hey, it's good to see you, brother. And they'll tell you right now, if they were to stand up, and they would tell you that I respect them. I highly respect them. If there was a chair, and I was sitting in it, it was the only chair, and they walked in the room, I would get up immediately and say, we want to sit down. You know what? We need to esteem those who have been, come before us. We need to esteem those men of God who have labored, and not in vain. They've labored before the Lord, because the Bible says that when the master shepherd comes, he's going to reward those who, who labored for him. It doesn't matter if you're up front. It doesn't matter if you're in front of these lights. It doesn't matter if you're on the stage. What matters is that you're ministering unto the Lord. You know what they call it? An audience of one. An audience of one. Because I can minister before an audience of hundreds, but it really doesn't matter because God is interested in what I do before the audience of one. And when, when men of God rise up to that place where they minister without anybody watching them. That's when it's so awesome ministry. I heard a story of a pastor one time who uh, he wanted to be a pastor so bad. He wasn't a pastor yet. And so the, the lead pastor asked him to sweep the parking lot. And he thought, sweep the parking lot, man? You know, I don't want to do that. But I know that if I don't do that, I'm not going to be pastorly. And so he heard that they were having a board meeting that day. So what happened? He made sure that he positioned himself where the boardroom, where they could see him sweeping the parking lot. And so he got, he got the broom, and, you know, every time he passed by the, the boardroom window, he really was putting effort into it, you know, and pushing it and making dust fly all over, you know. And, and uh, whenever he would pass by the window, you know, he would be like, oh, man, and kind of be mediocre, right? And he, so he swept the whole parking lot. And then he saw the pastor's car drive up. And the pastor got out and he says, 
what are you doing, man? Did you guys break for me? He goes, no, we canceled the board meeting. And he thought, man, I did all this work, and, and you guys weren't even there to see me, you know, watch me. Well, that's what he gets. Because you know what? If you're doing it to impress man, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. But if you live your life and minister for an audience of one, the only one, that's a capital O, then that's when, that's when you're doing the right thing. And when, when a man or a woman of God works in that capacity, we need to honor them. We need to hold them in esteem. Well, we see this, and we need to teach our kids about them. We need, you know what? We tell our kids about these heroes of the faith, and we need to teach them to have respect for those people who minister before the Lord. Because sometimes, I'm sorry, folks, in our country, our children are being challenged to have the right attitude in everything that they do. But we, as Christian parents, we need to raise them and train them in this way. Well, the word goes on. He says, to supply. He says, this work of Christ, he came close to death, excuse me, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. So this supply in these two words is summed up Epaphroditus' job and function, to supply, to supply. Now you might be there saying, I'm not a pioneer. I'm not a church planter. But you can be used by God to supply, to supply for the ministry. You know, my mother-in-law, she uh, has a house out in the country. And she always asks me when I talk about a pastor who's fatigued across the country, hey, tell them if they, get, if they buy a plane ticket, they could stay here all week. And I'll cook for them. I'll make all their meals. And they could just lounge. And they could do whatever. And I have an extra bedroom. You know what? That's supplying for the ministry. And I'll, I'll sometimes talk to these guys. And, and I'll say, hey, you know, I don't know if you, if you could afford it. But if you can make it out to Colorado, we'll pick you up from the airport. And, uh, I mean, you'll get a, a good cooked meal. Believe me, my mother-in-law cooks really well. That's why I can't see my feet. But, you know, you're going to get a, a really good cook meal. She'll, she'll just pamper you for a week. She'll even take care of your kids, you know what I mean, your little brats, so you could go out and do something with your, with your spouse. And, and that's supplying ministry to, 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 to pioneers, to church planters, to those who are working for the Lord. You know, we have, these, we have these abilities, and you could do so many things. And I could go on and on. You could read between the lines. You could do so many things to minister to those who are ministering for the Lord. But my main, my main thing or my main idea here this morning is that ministry takes a team. It takes a team. Folks, it takes all of us. It takes pioneers. It takes church planters. It takes those who support. We're all in this. If you've been a Christian, if somebody led you to Christ in the vestibule before service, guess what? You're on the team. You need to do something. You need to ask the Lord what God is doing in your heart, what he's going to stir that you might do. You never know. He might make you a pastor. He might make you a church planner. But I can guarantee you this. He is making you a supplier of needs. He is calling you to support the ministry of God. And if, you, if that's you this morning and you do maybe need counsel in those areas, uh, you know what? Talk to somebody here on staff and let's talk about it. If you desire to be a lay pastor, let's talk about it. If you desire to... Uh, go out and visit hospitals or you want some instruction man I want to go to my neighbors I want to tell them about the Lord but I don't know how let's talk about it look me up email me pull Pastor Tom aside or pull even Mary Allen is a great person to talk to uh, Pastor Tom's wife she has a lot of knowledge in this area uh, some Pastor Ben we, we could go on and on and on because there's we want to share with you guys we want to train you want to equip you to go out and encourage you to preach the gospel because you can do it you can do it. And in fact, we know that maybe you don't even have to have words, but actions speak louder than those words. Amen? Amen. As we have the band come on up, I want to challenge you this morning as we come to a close and we get excited for this afternoon. I want to do some business with the Lord this morning too. Church is not just to hear a great message, but some of you guys have been sitting there going, can you please please ask me if I want to receive Jesus. So as the band comes out, I'm going to invite you to all stand this morning. You might even be here saying to yourself, this is foreign to me. And it's probably foreign because you're not a believer. And so let's take care of that right now. If you'll pray with me. Father, we do come before you.
Lord, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for your presence here in this room. And Lord, I do blatantly want to address this. Lord, if there's anybody in this room this morning that does not know you, I pray right now that they would pray with me. Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I pray that you forgive me for my sins, that you cleanse me from all unrighteousness, that you would make me a child of the King. Lord, I pray that you would give me wisdom to know you, to know more about you, wisdom to read your word, that you would give me wisdom and knowledge to find you, even though you're not far away. Lord, I pray that you would encourage me, that you would send Christians around me, that I would even seek them out, that I might know you more, know what it means to be a Christian more. But most importantly, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just make me a part of your family. If you prayed that this morning, the Lord loves you and he forgives you. And you're part of the body of Christ. If that was your prayer this morning, something that you want, wanted so deep inside your heart. And for the rest of us, Lord, <laughs> we call ourselves Christians and we are, Lord, but we get our hands and our feet dirty. Lord, we say things throughout the week that are not pleasant to you. We have thoughts that are not pleasant to the body. Lord, we pray right now that you would cleanse our hands, that you would cleanse our feet. Lord, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We also confess that we are sinners. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your tender kindness, Lord, towards us. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us this morning as we go out of this place, Father God, that we would be supporters of your call, of your ministry. Lord, that we would not forget that we play an intricate role in the body of Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. My Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Yes, sir.